Today we're going to tackle Chapter 9, Cognition and Perception. Uh, really fascinating chapter. I think you're going to enjoy it. I know I will. <laughs> when stimuli are grouped according to the perceived similarity of their attributes, it is called a taxonomic categorization strategy. Taxonomic categorization answers uh, are especially common among Westerners. We try to put things together. Uh, two mammals. Um, we might put the carrot with the rabbit because the rabbit eats carrots. Uh, we may put the dog and the rabbit together because they are both mammals. Uh, that's a taxonomic categorization. We do this a lot. We, we try to put like things together. As a matter of fact, that's part of the SAT test. That's part of, of uh, most uh, intelligence tests or achievement tests is putting uh, is taxonomic categorization. Thematic uh, categorization strategy is where stimuli are grouped together on the basis of causal, temporal, or spatial relationships. Thematic categorization is especially common in East Asia. This difference in categorization strategies reflects an underlying difference in the ways that people attend to their worlds. Um, and I, uh, well, and this has to do with, with analysis, is the way that people analyze thing, things. Uh, they, and in this case, uh, the, the puppy has a hold of the carrot. So that would be uh, a temporal thing. It would, oh no, the dog goes with the carrot because the dog has a hold of the carrot, even though dogs really don't eat carrots. Analytic thinking is characterized by a focus on objects and their attributes. Objects are perceived as existing independently from their context. They are understood in terms of their component parts. Context is very important. The attributes that make up objects are used as a basis for categorizing them, and a set of fixed abstract rules is used to predict and explain the behavior of these objects. Analytic thinking is more common in Western countries than in China, Japan, and Korea, in the Asian countries. Holistic thinking is characterized by an orientation to the context as a whole. It represents an associative way of thinking which gives attention to the relations among objects and the surrounding context. So this would be uh, holistic thinking, uh, seeing the forest, and uh, in this case the uh, intact orange, and this would be analytical thinking, trying to break things down into their component parts. So this would be seeing the, the trees for the forest, not seeing the forest, but seeing the trees. This is the way uh, Western uh, thinking goes. It's, uh, it's more analytical. Uh, it's our way of putting things together. We put things together by breaking them apart. And that's the way education works in, in, uh, in the Western world as well. Uh, now that we are telling people that they, uh, once upon a time in the Western world, a Renaissance man was, was highly sought after. What, what is a Renaissance man? It's somebody that is accomplished in all the sciences. Uh, they're accomplished in the arts. Uh, they may write poetry. They may compose music. Uh, they uh, understand uh, physics. They understand, uh, they understand lots of different things almost everything. They uh, have that strange curiosity. Uh, but we don't really educate people uh, this way. As a matter of fact, um, uh, so when you go to college, they, they force you to major in something. You can't just major in general studies. Uh, there are some institutions that allow you to do that, but most institutions want you to, to ma major in something. They want you to uh, to be a physicist, or they want you to be a mathematician, or they want you to be a doctor or a lawyer, uh, and in which case you're, you're, you can get general information, but not a lot of general information. Once you get past your first two years, everything else is medicine if you're, you want to be a doctor. After you get through your first two years, everything else is, is the law if you want to be a lawyer. If you want to be a physicist, then you focus on physics. Uh, and that's the way we, we uh, educate people in, in the United States, in the Western world. We, we're not generalists. We are, we are specifists. 
and that's the way we want our 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 people. Now this this there 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 is something positive about this, but there's also something negative about it. The positive thing is that they know everything about this one topic. Uh, the problem with that is they often don't see the forest for the trees, and and this may have been a problem during COVID. Uh, we had all of these experts that were looking at things and they weren't really seeing the big picture. They were just seeing their little little section of the picture. Uh, and, and of course, that's that can be a problem. The, ho the whole concept behind uh, liberal arts uh, uh, is that you you become a generalist, you, you know a lot of different things, and you're able to function in a lot of different areas. Uh, and that's liberal arts. But liberal arts is not the uh, the final impetus uh, that we have in education we ha have very we have very few people that are, are generalists uh, I was educated in the 50s 60s and 70s and uh, primarily and then in, in the 2000s but um, education back then was more general so you picked up a lot of different things you had to take uh, when I first started in college uh, I was supposed to take Latin and Greek and physics and chemistry and uh, biology and a foreign language since uh, the Greek and Latin I would be taking were both dead languages at the time uh, and and I was supposed to take um, uh, a foreign language and I took Spanish because I'd studied it in high I'd studied two years of it in high school um, and I, I needed uh, to take English classes you know the gen the gen eds that you have today uh, that was they were expanded back then, but uh, things changed. Uh, actually, they changed while I was in college, and I never took physics and chemistry. I just took biology. Uh, I didn't have to take uh, Latin or, or Greek because, well, I'd taken Latin in, in high school, but uh, no, now nobody teaches Latin. Why in the world would you, would you need Latin today? Um, the reason you needed Latin back in the 60s is because it wasn't until the 60s that uh, the, the Catholic Church stopped doing all of their masses in, uh, in Latin. All of, they had to do their mass in Latin. And now, of course, it's, uh, it's whatever the local language is. But uh, back then, uh, all mass, no matter where you were in the world, it was always in Latin. And a lot of people, of course, didn't speak Latin, but other people did. Uh, in holistic thinking, objects are understood in terms of how they relate to the rest of the context, and their behavior is predicted and explained on the basis of those relationships. So they're looking for relationships in holistic thinking. In Western thinking, we're trying to break everything down into its component parts. Holistic thinking also emphasizes knowledge gained through experience rather than the application of fixed abstract rules. Holistic thinking is more common in East Asia, and East Asia uh, that we're talking about is Korea, China, and Japan. Analytic thinkers tend to show field independence. They can separate objects from their background fields. Holistic thinkers tend to show field dependence. They tend to view objects as bound uh, to their background. So if we look at this picture, uh, of course, what do we see? Do we see a headless lady with uh, her legs and her, and her hands are intact? but her body is gone, her torso is not there. Uh, so what are we actually seeing? We're seeing a lady with a mirror in her hands, of course, and it looks like she doesn't have a torso, but of course it's behind the mirror. And if we look at this, uh, to the holistic thinker, they see this as uh, Michael Jackson, and to the uh, analytic thinker, we see all these different pixels. Uh, so we're we're more looking at the pixels than we are. And this is one of the reasons why when you go to the uh, mall and, and they've got that picture, do you see the sailboat in the picture? You know, it, it takes people a, a while because we, we see things by their component parts. And if we, were, if we were Asian and holistic thinkers, we would see it right away. East Asians have been socialized uh, from such a young age to attend to relationships uh, that they do uh, so unconsciously scanning scenes. They, they, they're looking for relationships. Uh, Westerners have been uh, socialized to attend to focal objects, and they thus habitually tend to
to direct their attention at such objects. In other words, they just see the objects. <clears throat> they see the individual objects. Looking at the art of East Asia, we can see that the art is very different from Western art. Uh, East Asian art is painted with a higher uh, horizon, creating more context in the picture. Uh, in their portraits, the background is much more complex, and the figures in the paintings are smaller than in Western art. And these are, are both pictures. Uh, this is a, a picture from China, and this is a, th they're both pictures from China, actually. Uh, so as we can see exactly what they're talking about. Uh, the figures are much smaller. Uh, this figure would be much smaller. Now we're going to go to American art or Western art. This is China again. Uh, we see we, there's a lot of context that we're dealing with uh, a higher, uh, a lower horizon so that we see more, more context. Uh, this is from Japan. We're seeing the same, same concept. Um, this is from the Louvre. This is, uh, <laughs> I can't think of what it is, anyway. Uh, pictures from the Louvre. Uh, Masuda and Gonzalez uh, and colleagues in 2008 had American and East Asian students draw landscapes with a person, river, tree, house, and a horizon. They were seeking to see the difference between the two groups. East Asians drew a horizon that was significantly higher in the picture than it was for Americans. East Asians tended to provide a more complex background in their drawings. East Asians included 75% more contextual objects than did the Americans. East Asians were more likely than Americans to situate their objects in context. And this is an East Asian picture. And these are American pictures, as you can see, not as much context. <laughs> when East Asians take photographs of others, they tend to include more background. They also tend to have smaller figures in their portraits compared to Americans. This is actually an American picture of Americans uh, dressing. <laughs> Sorry. This is dressing like uh, as if they were in Japan. This is, these are pictures from Japan. And there you go. Lots of context, lots of background. And this is an American picture. American pictures. Kids are huge. That's what you want to see. And the uh, background is out of focus. Yeah, pretty much. The background's out of focus. Only the kids are in focus. Uh, American, American. When Masada and Gonzalez and, and colleagues in 2008 looked at American and East Asian Facebook pages, they found that East Asian photos had smaller figures and larger backgrounds compared to American photos. There we go. And there we go. Looking at Japanese photographs of buildings, researchers discovered that these photographs had more boundary structures than American photographs. And this is a photograph in Japan. How do we know? Because all the cars are white. We can also see the Japanese writing over here. That's in Japan. And that's those are both in Japan, obviously. This is in Japan. Not a whole lot of pagodas in the United States. Physical landscapes from Japan are literally busier than landscapes in the United States. And more Japanese pictures. And these are pictures from the United States. This is the U.S. Capitol. This is a church. As you can see, not a whole lot of, a lot less uh, uh, context. And pictures from the United States once again. And that's the Chrysler Building in New York City. Since cities in East Asia tend to be more crowded than Western cities, living in the busier physical environment fosters the ability to attend to a lot more information at once. When they looked at uh, how scientists from East Asia pre present their findings on posters, they had busier posters with more words than North American participants. This is a North American 
uh, poster. And let me show. There you go. That's that's an East Asian poster. <laughs> As you can see, lots and lots of words. Uh, there you go. This would be easier to take in, of course, than that. Researchers looked at government and university websites in East Asia and North America. The Asian websites were much longer than the, the North American websites and had significantly more links and words. The East Asian websites were busier with more information for people to navigate. And this, of course, is from Asia. And I didn't, don't have one from, from the United States. Researchers discovered that Westerners were more likely to explain people's behaviors in terms of their underlying dispositions, while East Asians had po and possibly people from other cultures were more likely to explain people's behaviors in terms of contextual variables. <clears throat> so when we're talking about uh, t contextual variables, uh, you know, this is this child uh, turns it in. Well, I, I, this isn't a good example. Uh, that's the reason I put it there. Uh, th this would be a, an Asian way of looking at things. They're looking for at, for context, and this would be uh, a Western way of seeing the same the same uh, circumstance. When people from India and the United States were asked to describe a person, the Americans were more likely to describe people in abstract personality traits, and Indians describe people in concrete behaviors they observed. She is friendly. She brings cakes to my family on festival days. And in the United States, or they would say, well, she, she's kind of depressed. She does smile sometimes, but uh, they would describe her personality. Researchers analyzing news stories of murders in the United States, China, and Japan discovered that the East Asian papers described the murders in situational terms. The murderer had a rivalry with another student. They had been recently fired. The American reports tried to interpret the situation from a dispositional point of view. The murderer had a very bad temper. The shooter was described as mentally unstable. So the East Asian are, are seeing context, and uh, the people from the United States are uh, trying to determine uh, what attributes these individuals have that would make them shoot somebody. Personality information is not seen as equally important for explaining the behavior of others in all cultural contexts. Westerners tend to use personality information more for understanding others and themselves than Asians do. Uh, and one of the, the, the things that we need to remember here is that East Asians, remember, they're a collectivist country. Uh, so they assume everybody's going to act the same. Uh, in the United States, of course, we're an individualistic country. And therefore, personality is a, is a lot more important. Why in the world? There was a shooter this morning in, in Texas, I think, at a high school in Texas. Shot four people. You know, what we want to know is why in the world did they do, do this? Uh, what were they? What were they angry at? You know, this is something that we would uh, we would need to know. In China, of course, where it would is less likely to happen because they're a collectivist country, they don't need that information. They they're not looking for that information. People from many other non-Western cultures show a pattern of focusing on situation rather than the, than disposition similar to East Asians. <clears throat> Religious groups differ in their attributions as well. American Protestants are more likely than American Catholics to make dispositional attributions. This difference between sects appears to be a function of Protestants having a greater commitment to the idea that people have individual souls. And of course, uh, we've already uh, discussed uh, the, uh, the Catholic movement. Uh, they're more collectivist in their way of looking at things. Uh, in uh, the uh, Protestant religion, most Protestant religions, they don't want the, the whole church to, to e each individual has their own uh, pathway to, uh, to heaven is the idea. And so they're far more individualistic. So they're looking more for dis dis dispositional attributes, <clears throat> the Protestants are. If people believe that people are judging them on the basis of what their soul has done, it follows that they are more likely to view the soul as being the cause of the individual's behavior. That's a religious joke. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I'm sorry, it's my fault. Uh, people's socioeconomic status predicts the kinds of attributions that people make. Working class Americans make more situational attributions and a few dispositional attributions than middle class Americans. Uh, they see everybody, uh, they, they are far more collectivistic in their way of thinking, uh, working class people, because they're doing the same thing every day, day after day. Uh, they see things as uh, less uh, individualistic uh, than, uh, than people who are not working class. Uh, the same kinds of class differences in explaining other people's behaviors have also been found in France. The working class people are, are very similar to that. Uh, the same kinds of class differences in explaining other people's behaviors have also been found in Russia. Uh, the same kind of uh, class differences in explaining other people's behaviors have also been found in India. Now, this is really kind of fascinating because we're, work we're talking about the working class people in the United States. Uh, in 2016 and 2020, uh, they voted for Donald Trump. Now, you would think that uh, some of the, the uh, strange things that he has done uh, that they would be upset about that, but they don't. They don't read things the same way that uh, uh, middle class and upper class people do, and for that reason, uh, they they overlooked uh, the the, the uh, some of the negative things he said, some of the negative things that he's done, and it was the same same thing in France. It was the same thing in Russia. Same thing in India. Uh, so the working class people are, are less likely to look for uh, personality reasons for something happening. If analytic thinkers tend to view the world as operating to a set of universal abstract rules and laws, they will apply these rules and laws when trying to make sense of a situation. This is termed rule-based reasoning. Holistic thinkers should be more likely to make sense of a situation by considering the relationships among objects and events. Uh, they should look for evidence of uh, events clustering together, such as similarity among events or of temporal uh, contiguity of events. This is termed associative reasoning. Westerners appear to, to view change as occurring in linear ways. Change appears in uh, static and predictable ways. Stocks rise after an election. Stocks will rise in 2020. Uh, East Asians believe that change happens in fluid and unpredictable ways. Uh, this is a Chinese story of unpredictability. One day an old uh, farmer's horse ran away from him. His neighbors came to comfort him, but he said, How can you know it isn't a good thing that my horse ran away? A few days later, his horse came back, bringing a wild horse with it. His neighbors came to congratulate the old man who said, how can you know it isn't a bad thing? A few weeks later, the old farmer's son was trying to ride the wild horse and fell off, breaking his leg. When the, the neighbors came over to express condolence and condolences, the old man said, how can you know it isn't a good thing that he broke his leg while riding the wild horse? The next month, a war broke out and all the able-bodied young men were recruited to fight in it. Uh, the old farmer's son did not have to go because of his broken leg, and he survived with his father. And that is the story of, that's the Chinese story of unpredictability. It was a good thing that he broke his leg. East Asians have been shown to place more value on things that have happened in the past compared with the future. The opposite is found with North Americans. Uh, attitudes toward future vary uh, across cultures, and East Asians have quite different ex expectations and predictions about the future compared with Westerners. Uh, e East Asians look backwards a lot more than, than uh, Westerners do. Westerners are always looking toward the future. Creativity is the generation of ideas that are novel, uh, useful, and appropriate. Westerners prefer novel objects more than East Asians. They generate a larger number of ideas when they are primed with individualistic thoughts than collectivistic ones. And Asian Americans show more divergent thinking when primed with American culture compared with Asian culture. The novelty part of the equation appears to be facilitated by individualism and Western cultural experiences. This is one of the reasons why there are a lot more inventions coming out of North America and Europe.
Western thinking. It uh, induces creative thought. Good creative ideas involve novel solutions that are appropriate for the problem at hand. Collectivism appears to be associated with a generation of useful rather than novel ideas. In collective contexts, people are socialized to be concerned about the opinions of others and to find solutions that will fit with the goals of the members of the group. And for that reason, if you're brainstorming uh, with a group of collectivistic uh, individuals, they don't want to hear uh, uh, ideas that are outside the box, that are outside the, the norm. Uh, they just want to hear ideas that are within the norm. And this is one of the reasons why creativity is stifled in collectivistic uh, countries. When Singaporeans were assigned to work together, researchers discovered that they were more likely to comment uh, on appropriateness of their ideas than when they worked by themselves. Their ideas became less original in groups. Now you have to remember Singapore is part of East Asia. When the same research was done in Israel, they found that the Israelis were more affected by the presence of others in the same way. Another collectivistic country. When the same research was done in the Netherlands, they found that the Dutch were not affected by the presence of others in the same way. When the same research was done in Korea, they found that the Koreans reacted more similarly to the Singaporeans than the Israelis and the Dutch. More collectivistic East Asian cultures with their emphasis on useful ideas are more likely to foster in incremental innovations, whereas more individualistic Western cultures with their emphasis on novel ideas encourage more breakthrough ideas. Japan is the world leader in terms of the number of patents it receives each year. Uh, most of their patents represent incremental improvements, particularly in telecommunications, information technology, and electronics. So they're small ideas. They're not breakthrough ideas. It's not Apple. Uh, Apple comes up, up with, uh, with iPads. They, got, they came up with iPhones. Uh, they, they miniaturized, then they expanded uh, telephones. Um, things coming out of Japan are incremental. Uh, they're small improvements on things. Talking in, these, these are two uh, inventions in, uh, from Japan. Uh, people fall asleep in the subway all the time. They're very crowded. As you can see, she's holding her head up uh, with a, a suction cup and a hat. I don't know what her hat, hat says. And this lady, of course, is, has fallen asleep standing up. And she has a stanchion here that is holding her up. Uh, it's got it's a three point stanchion here. There's a leg. There's a leg, and here's a leg. And uh, she has fallen asleep on the stanchion. Talking and language have held a privileged position in much of Western intellectual history. Among the ancient Greeks, Homer concluded that there was no greater skill than uh, to be a good debater, and Socrates thought that knowledge existed within people and could be revealed only through verbal reasoning. In Judeo-Christian beliefs, the word was viewed as sacred because of the divine power to create. In the United States, the freedom to speak one's mind is a birthright protected by the First Amendment to the Constitution. And, of course, the First Amendment has to do with free speech. Speaking is valued in the West because it is viewed as an act of self-expression and as, as inextricably bound to thought. In many East Asian cultural traditions, there has been less emphasis on talking, if not outright suspicion, of the spoken word. And this is a Laotian proverb, listen with one ear, be suspicious with the other. That's uh, from Laos. Laos is a, is a country that's uh, just west of uh, Vietnam, along with Cambodia. And then Thailand's just north of there. Lao Tzu wrote, he who knows does not speak. He who speaks does not know. In other words, uh, the people that do the most speaking are the ones that uh, have very little knowledge. The ones who do no speaking are the ones with the most knowledge. Practitioners of many Eastern religions pursue truth through silent meditation rather than through spoken prayer. And if you've ever been around uh, Buddhist monks, uh, there is some chanting, but uh, most of it is just repetitive. It's just rote, 
there's not individual prayers. A Korean proverb states, an empty cart makes more noise. Uh, Eastern cultural uh, traditions have not cultivated a belief that thought and speech are closely related. And this is one of the reasons why uh, if you go to uh, Japan or Korea or China, I guess you could go to China. I, <laughs> I was in the military and we weren't allowed to go to China. Uh, but uh, we went to Korea and we went to Japan and went to Vietnam, of course. Um, so if you're trying to convince somebody to go out on a date with you, um, you know, and you're from the United States, of course, you, uh, you have a line and you have a patter and you try to, to pick somebody up with your, with your speech. And of course, that's the opposite of how things happen in, uh, in East Asia. So if you're trying to pick up a, a Korean lady, uh, by talking to her. Uh, you failed already by opening your mouth. <laughs> uh, it's the same way in Japan. And I, I assume it's the same way in China, but I've never actually been there. Japanese mothers have been shown to speak less to their children than American mothers. Uh, Chinese infants as young as seven months have been shown to vocalize less in response to laboratory events than European American infants. Much of what is communicated in the course of a conversation goes beyond the actual words that are used and is expressed in nonverbal gestures, facial expressions, and voice tone. People seem to be easier to upset in an email than when you are face-to-face -face with them. They can't see your smile and wink. So, and, and this may be one of the reasons why there's so much trolling out there. Uh, people may be kidding, but uh, you can't tell they're kidding because you can't see their face. They, you can't see them smiling when they're saying it, uh, which tells you they're just... Just kidding. People often resort to adding emoticons or abbreviations to their email or text messages to add the nonverbal contextual cues that are lacking in emails or text messages. Nonverbal communication is important in all cultures, but there are some rather pronounced cultural differences in the degree to which communication relies on explicit verbal information versus more implicit nonverbal cues and of course this is uh, these are nonverbal this is nonverbal uh, communication uh, yeah okay and they're telling you this person thinks you're lying and they're not open to any more communication uh, this guy's lying is not looking at you um, he has his leg out which is and it's pointing toward you, and that may mean that uh, uh, he thinks you're menacing and he's trying to defend himself. Uh, he's got his arms crossed, which makes him aggressive. Uh, he's got a look on his face that tells you that he's insecure. He's insecure and uh, he has a hostile attitude because his, his body's slumped. Uh, this person is defensive because she's got her hands up but she is interested. Uh, this person thinks you're stupid and they are impatient to leave because they've got their hands in their pockets, trying to keep from moving their hands. In high context cultures, people are deeply involved with each other. And this involvement leads them to have much shared information that guides their behavior. Much of what is uh, to be communicated can be inferred because people have a great deal of information in common that they can rely on and thus they can be less explicit in what they say. And of course this is uh, true in collectivist countries. Uh, East Asians are good examples of high context cultures. Western and English speaking countries are generally good examples of low context cultures. What is conveyed in verbal communication in East Asian languages is less explicit than what is communicated in English and for that reason this person, this is an East Asian, she's very bored with this guy, he's filling the air with words, and that's probably the last thing that he wants to do if he's trying to make an impression, a good impression on her. The words that are said in Japan are often less important than the way that they are said. A pause and a strained look on the face of a Japanese speaker communicates that the information they have is dissatisfying no matter what the words they use. 
The key information is conveyed non-verbally, with the content of the words sometimes being rather empty. And of course, this is what happened uh, during World War II. Uh, we should have been aware that the Japanese uh, were hostile toward us, uh, but they were saying platitudes. Uh, we were accept accepting what they were saying rather than what their attitude was. We needed to watch their military to see what was going on. And, and of course, in Japan, it's what you do, not what you say, that is important. What you say is, is sometimes completely unnecessary. And, uh, and we missed all that because we didn't understand Japan. We didn't understand who they were and, and how they uh, approached things. And so what, that's what we needed to do. We needed to, to see what they were doing, not what they were saying. We shouldn't have believed what they said because, what they, because the words don't mean a lot. It's their actions that mean a lot that means something. Since so much is conveyed through a nonverbal communication by the Japanese, they tend to have far more trouble leaving messages on answering machines. They're more selective of their wording because they are visualizing how the person on the other end is receiving their message. And that is the end of that chapter. We'll pick, pick more of this up next time. Um, I, I find it fascinating. All these things I find fascinating. Of course, I've been to Japan. I've been to to Korea. So uh, I understand the whole collectivist thing. If you've never been in, in a really collectivist country, it's really difficult to understand what's, what's happening. The Japanese, as we said before, the Japanese language uh, uses, uh, our verbs are more important than nouns. So, uh, you know, you put all this stuff together and uh, a lot of times what is being said is not important uh, at all as far as they're concerned. So, it's the way that they say it. Uh, when I was, when we were living in Japan, one of the things we were told, they'll always say yes to you. Uh, they don't mean yes, uh, it, but it's the way that they say it. And as Americans, of course, we're going to talk about uh, look, uh, how the Japanese read people and how uh, Americans read people, and they're completely different. And for that reason, of course, that's why we missed, we should have known that they were going to attack uh, they were going to attack, maybe not Pearl Harbor, but they were going to attack. And we didn't know it. We didn't understand it. So uh, it's, it's really fascinating as far as I'm concerned, because this is part of history, of course. Uh, so uh, we'll pick this up next time. Uh, chapter 10 follows the same line of thinking. Uh, so uh, I'll talk to you next week.